child. Um, oh, thank you. Uh, when I was 12 or so, uh, I began volunteering at a local uh, historic house museum, um, Fort Clock, for any of you who are familiar with the Mohawk Valley. And there was just something about that large stone hearth that called to me. Um, and it's taken years of volunteering at historic sites, um, practical foodways experience, and more years of grad school than <clears throat> I care to count at this point to start developing my understanding of historic kitchens and historic foodways. And that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. Uh, the ways in which we can use micro level resources to begin to understand a broader historical world. Um, I had never intended to pursue a doctoral degree. Um, I was happily working in museums and I read a book and in it, the author described how to churn butter. And it became very clear from his account that he had never churned butter in his life and just didn't understand the process of it. Um, so one of the things that I'm really passionate about is um, uh, making academic history accessible to broad public audiences. Anytime I've given a tour or done a program, my approach is always to find the least interested person in the group and try to make it fascinating to them. So hopefully you all are able to get a little something um, out of my talk tonight. So my current research um, explores the Long Hudson River Valley and the Roman Beck Van Cortland families. And I'm calling it the Long Hudson River Valley because historically, the cultural connections and the transmission of knowledge wasn't restricted to the navigable portions of the Hudson River stretching from New York City to the Albany area. It extended up the overland routes to Lake George and Lake Champlain and into Canada in the north and out to the trading center of New York and from there to the entire world. You can see on these maps, in 1685, we have New Netherland and we have this whole big corridor stretching up. In 1883, it shrunk a little bit. The Hudson River runs from New York up to Caldwell, which is a place we'll be speaking. But our modern understanding of the Hudson River Valley has shrunk. So you can see this progression from a large long Hudson River Valley shrinking down to kind of the space and the geography that we recognize today. Um, for me, the Roman Beck Van Cortland families perfectly capture what it was like for 18th and 19th century New Yorkers to really be negotiating who they were and how they defined themselves within the Hudson Valley. Over the last year, I've been exploring the ways in which Catherine Beck Van Cortland's kitchen at Van Cortland Manor and her family cookery book um, helped to answer questions I have about cultural identity on the long Hudson River Valley and the ways in which cultural knowledge was transferred from person to person and from generation to generation. In particular, over this last year, I've been exploring how cultural identity was expressed and affirmed in kitchen spaces in early America. And so in a lot of ways, our story begins at Van Cortland Manor in Croton on Hudson, or at least ends there. I first visited Van Cortland Manor last summer. It was the summer of 2020 when I was a research fellow for the Women's History Institute at Historic Hudson Valley. I was excited to delve into HHV's collection of 18th century cookery books to gain insights into what eating in New York was like during the 1700s. However, traveling into Westchester County during the peak of the local COVID-19 pandemic was a little bit like entering a different world. What had originally been intended as a residential fellowship was transformed into weekly day trips into a closed archive. I'd been advised not to stop anywhere unnecessarily, and so I filled my car with gas and I bought co brought coffee from home to undertake the five hour round trip. I spent my days in a large conference room, anxiously sanitizing shared surfaces before I left at the end of the day. And perhaps I found myself increasingly drawn into moments of historical dissonance because my research experience was so psychologically jarring and new to me. A world that I thought I understood had become chaotic and uncertain. And so too had the topic that I had come to study in this archive. What I had anticipated would be a straightforward analysis of family cookery books led me to questions of identity politics, cultural embodiment and practice, and the ways in which gendered knowledge was transferred in the 18th and early 19th century New York world. 
With the uncertainty of traveling during a period of social lockdown in mind, I arranged to meet um, Historic Hudson Valley staff at Van Cortlandt Manor to give me context for some of the documents I'd been studying. It was a hot, hazy morning in June when I drove past the um, eerily empty shopping center and pulled into the shaded parking lot of the museum. There was a pea gravel path that trailed up a hill to the right and to the left, there was this marshy lowland that was punctuated by trees and shrubs. Beyond that was the noise and traffic of the Croton Expressway, a railroad, and then finally, the water of Croton Bay opening onto the Hudson River. My guides arrived and led me up a gravel path towards the manor house, pictured here. You can see my photos tend to be a little hazy. It was very muggy that day, so I apologize for that. The path that we had traveled up opened onto a large semicircular courtyard that was overlooked by the large stone house seen here and mature trees. We stepped into the shade of the two-story porch and entered the basement kitchen. Stepping into the dim room after the brightness outside was startling, and as my eyes adjusted, the room came into view, a long, low room with a brick floor. There was a large work table directly in front of the hearth with a cupboard to the left. An opening to the right of the table led into the house's cold storage room pictured here on the left. At the far opposite end of the room on the right, you can see a doorway into a study and the stairs up to the first floor. I had been expecting some sort of thrill of recognition when I stepped into this space. I had spent the last two months studying Catherine Beck Van Cortlandt and her family recipes and some secret part of me had hoped to find her in this kitchen space. But life is hardly ever as tidy and convenient as movies and novels would have you believe. And as so many of you already know, I'm sure historical research is oftentimes a lot less glamorous than that. So I was a bit foolish maybe to expect to find the 19th century mistress of the house in a recreated 18th century kitchen. Her time spent in this home would have been largely limited um, to giving directions to domestic staff or light cooking or baking on special occasions. But my expectation did cause me to reassess my research and begin to wonder if Catherine Beck's uh, Van Cortlandt's family recipes weren't confined just to the kitchen space, but instead maybe to the entire estate, maybe to the entire landscape to which she existed. Catherine Beck was born in Albany, New York in 1818. She's photoed, uh, photoed uh, her painted here on the left. Um, we have a small image of Albany, the Albany she was growing up in, um, in 1818. She was born to prominent parents. Her mother was Harriet Caldwell, who was the daughter of a well-known and prosperous Albany merchant named James Caldwell. Caldwell was a serial entrepreneur of varied interests, but he was of great influence in the region. James and his brother Joseph Caldwell had migrated from Ireland to the Philadelphia area in the late 1860s, where they found work with a merchant named Francis Wade. Through Wade, the Caldwell brothers became affiliated with Sir William Johnson and other merchants um, in the Albany region. The brothers eventually relocated to the Albany area and attempted to establish their own business. Their first venture was a dry goods store in Albany on Market Street, which if you look at my map, Ah, it's just, mm, it's just off the side. Oh, bad cropping. I apologize about that. Um, it was on Marcus Street in Albany, though. Uh, they sold much desired and much sought after imported goods, including tobacco, spices, and um, really refined alcohols. And the pair were exceedingly successful in their ventures, and they both also made advantageous marriages. So throughout the last quarter of the 18th century, James Caldwell deftly negotiated war, social strife, and the growing pains of a new nation to develop a vast trading network that ranged from the Western New York frontier to Montreal to New York City. He's perhaps best known for building a proto-industrial mills in the Albany area in the 1790s, right before the concept of industrialized production had become widespread. For my work and for my personal interests though, his most important contribution may have been the expansion of his commercial venture from Albany to the base of Lake George and the settlement of Caldwell. By the end of the 18th century, James Caldwell had acquired acres of land at the base of Lake George. 
And by the time Catherine Beck was born, he'd established an inn, a grist mill, and had several tenant farmers. We see here in 1817, the year before Catherine was born, the steamship James Caldwell um, on, the, on Lake George. Um, it typically um, brought people from the different settlements on Lake George um, around, but we have um, an early prototype of the steamship named after him. And on the right, we have a view of the settlement of Caldwell and James Caldwell's manor house. Caldwell was a shrewd businessman, um, and his decision to relocate his business to Lake George indicates that he very well understood this concept of the Long Hudson River Valley that seems a little unfamiliar to us today. Despite the fact that he was not yet connected to Albany or the Hudson River by water, he understood the deep connection between these regions and the commercial opportunities of being located between them and the broader world. It was at these commercial and cultural crossroads that Caldwell's granddaughter, Catherine, would spend time as a child, and it was here that she learned to understand the world around her. Catherine's mother, James Caldwell's daughter, was named Harriet, and she died tragically in 1823 of an unidentified illness, leaving Catherine and her sister without a mother. Catherine's father was Theodoric Roman Beck. He was a famous medical writer. Beck was born in 1791 in Schenectady and attended Union College. He authored a groundbreaking book on medical jurisprudence in 1823, around the same time as his wife's death. Some contemporaries cite this book as the only source of comfort for Beck during Harriet's illness and death, though I'm, I'm left to wonder if perhaps Beck's all-consuming work contributed perhaps a little bit to her neglect and subsequent illness. Um, during his life, Beck was working as a doctor and a medical educator in Albany, and also near Herkimer, New York, at the College of Physicians and Surgeons in Fairfield. He was also dedicating a substantial amount of time in his later life to studying individuals that he considered to be medically insane. In general, his career required him to travel substantially while his daughters grew, and he left substantial amounts of their care to his mother, Catherine Teresa Roman Beck. Grandmother Beck, as we will call her to avoid confusion because now we have two Catherine Becks, was by all accounts a force to be reckoned with. She was the daughter of Schenectady minister Dirk Roman and raised five sons after her husband died, seeing all of them into very successful careers. Her endeavors and the generational successes of her children were no doubt due in part to her prominent place in society. Grandmother Beck, um, was the granddaughter of Dirk Roman, who was a pastor that's connected to Dutch Reformed Church, and he was one of the founding members of Union College. The Romans were distantly Dutch, um, though the Becks were English and had made their way to Albany via Boston. In the eulogy read at T.R. Beck's funeral, it was stated that the family was of English origin, but had long been identified with the Dutch population. The Roman Beck and Caldwell families were successful at navigating the multi-ethnic world of 18th century New York. They succeeded in building and growing businesses, serving in public offices, and were recognized as eminent members of society. In 1836, Catherine Beck married Pierre Van Cortlandt III in Albany, pictured here. They then journeyed down the Hudson River to Croton on Hudson, and the couple settled at their household at Van Cortland Manor, which was the rural 17th century homestead of Pierre's ancestors. The Van Cortlands were one of the most prominent Dutch families of the Lower Hudson, with ties reaching deep into the establishment of New Netherlands trade between Manhattan and inland New York. In marrying Pierre, Catherine connected her prominent Upper Hudson Valley families with one of the oldest, most recognized Dutch families of the Lower Hudson. Through her own ancestry, Catherine was of English, Irish, and Dutch inheritance. Through marriage, she inherited one of the most recognizably Dutch New York names in the early, of the early period of our nation. For me, and through my research, I've come to believe that in many ways, Catherine represents the essence of New York during the first half of the 19th century. She was the product of a polyglot of cultures, who had forged and developed connections along the most important pre-Erie Canal highway of the state, the Hudson River Valley. Through her marriage, Catherine connected the length of the Long Hudson River, stretching from the Port of New York through the Lower Hudson Valley, the Upper Hudson Valley, and Albany, and the overland routes that connected Albany to Caldwell and from there north to Canada. 
She blended together the many ethnic inheritances of her biological and married families with her own personal tastes to demonstrate a newly enunciated American identity. These ideas, identities, and cultures all simmered and soaked together in one place, Catherine's kitchen at Van Cortlandt Manor. And yet Catherine Beck remains largely unstu unstudied. There's been no comprehensive study of this woman beyond a few paragraphs in late 19th century genealogies. And perhaps this is in many ways because her voice has been lost. There's no great consolidated collection of Catherine Beck's letters in an archive. And so instead, we're left to piece together her story using her family manuscript cookery books, the home she lived in, and a special appreciation for the practice of everyday life. Food was an important part of Catherine's everyday life. Her fa father's family had kept what is now known as the Beck Market Book, a collection of receipts that, as well as handwritten and copied recipes from the 18 teens and 1820s. You can see here that it's a small book. Um, it's a slim volume that contains handwritten as well as copied recipes. Um, it's interspersed with printed recipes and handy hints that were published in newspapers and periodicals that have been cut out and then pasted into this book. Catherine brought this book with her in 1836 when she moved to Van Cortlandt Manor. More importantly though, Catherine kept a collection of her own recipes to be passed on to posterity. The volume is now known as the Van Cortlandt Receipts, um, and it begins sometime in the early 1800s, likely before Catherine's tenure at Van Cortlandt Manor, and it terminates in 1865. Much like the Beck Market book, the Van Cortlandt Recipes um, is a combination of recipes copied from other cookery books, recipes shared by friends or neighbors, and newspaper clippings carefully pasted in here and there. There are a few particularly interesting entries that we'll be spending time with this evening. The first selection of notable receipts come from the Beck Market Book and is for two recipes that highlight the importance of regionality in the Beck family and one that begins to hint at the ways in which the family culturally identified and marked themselves. The first two recipes are for Lake George fruit cake and Lake George sugar cake. The last recipe that we'll talk about from the Beck Market Book is for conchies. So if you take a look um, at these recipes, if you're at all familiar with historic recipes, well, um, you'll kind of, you know, see the pattern here. At this point in history, oftentimes historic recipes were just a list of ingredients. Um, there was some assumption that the person reading it or looking at it would know how to um, assemble it, would know how to bake it or cook it. So you see that reflected here. The Lake George fruitcake, for example, three eggs, three coffee cups of sugar, two cups of butter, four cups of flour, one of milk, one teaspoonful of salaritus, which is a leavening agent, a wine glass of brandy, one pound of raisins, one pound of currants, two nutmegs, one tablespoonful of ground cloves. It would be a little bit different from fruit cake as you and I might know, um, but it would probably be something more akin to um, a Christmas pudding or something like that, um, that our friends uh, in the UK might be for, more familiar with. But looking at this, there's nothing about these two Lake George recipes that seems particularly or overly regional, and especially not specific to the Lake George area. There's nothing about raisins or eggs that just shouts, Lake George. It's likely though that the family received these recipes from a friend or acquaintance who lived near Lake George. Or perhaps they may have been dishes that they had made specially for them while they were in residence in Caldwell and they wanted to keep track of them for future use. In either case though, the Beck family's Lake George recipes were the result of a direct geographical connection to the region. Perhaps the connection is nothing more than that the family enjoyed these baked goods as special treats while they summered on the, su the southern shores of Lake George. It's certainly easy to imagine someone taking uh, the sweet buttery sugar cakes on lake outings with their family or serving them to visiting friends. In any case, the Beck family felt strongly enough that these two cakes were affiliated with Lake George and the time they spent there, that they needed to differentiate them from the other recipes in their cooking book, cookery book indicating a very strong sense of place that they themselves had already identified as early as the 1820s. The third recipe um, of particular interest to me from the Beck Market book is for conchies. 
According to the Beck Market Book, congees are made in the following way. Boil pumpkin, stiffen with Indian meal um, till to the size of a dumpling, boil three hours, slice, and toast. So essentially, congees are a pumpkin cornmeal dumpling that after being boiled is sliced and toasted. On its surface, this sounds like a delightful autumnal seasonal dish, kind of like um, I'm assuming a, like a pumpkin corn toasty that you might be familiar with. But a little bit more investigation will show us just how important this recipe is to understanding 18th and early 19th century New York and the Beck and Van Cortland families. The combination of pumpkin and cornmeal make this a uniquely hybrid culinary creation. Both maize, corn, and pumpkins were native to North America and were therefore unknown to the rest of the world until globalized trading networks began after 1492. However, the tradition of boiling dumplings was common throughout Europe and the rest of the world. What makes these conchies particularly interesting though are two things, their method of preparation and their very name themselves. And how these two things make conchies a unique culinary item is something that we will return to in just a moment. So the second cookery book that we'll be considering is the Van Cortland family recipes. Much like other manuscript cookery books of the late 18th and 19th centuries, this cookery book was edited by multiple generations. You may be familiar with the Van Rensselaer cookbook out of Cherry Hill, something very similar. We have multiple generations of women copying recipes, um, either from friends, family uh, members, other cookery books into the manuscript that they themselves have in their home. It's somewhat unclear in this volume where Catherine's contributions lie, other than in one undated entry that seems to have not been written in the cookery book at all. In fact, this entry appears to be a, the result of 21st century conservation techniques. So I was flipping through this book and it became obvious upon closer inspection that this one page was never a bound page in the cookery book. In fact, it was a standalone note that someone at some point had stuck between the leaves of the pages of the cookery book. And later when the book was sent out to be conserved, they bound the note into the book itself. So we would think, of course, this is a page in the book, but upon closer inspection, if you look at the materiality of the page, you can absolutely deduce that it was not intended to be part of the book originally. The note reads, I feel too unwell to write, but will soon. Love to all your something, it's obscured and unreadable, signed C.T. Beck. The author of that note was Catherine Teresa Roman Beck, our grandmother Beck who raised Catherine. While this note is undated, it must have been written at some point between Catherine's marriage in 1836 and grandmother Beck's death in 1853. The remaining contents of this note demonstrate the ways in which culinary knowledge was transferred in 19th century New York, and along with it, a self-consciously multi-ethnic identity that was, at least in part, negotiated and understood by the foods that these women were preparing, serving, and consuming. Following its brief greeting, Grandmother Beck's note lists four recipes. They are four conchies that we've just been discussing, Culling, Puffert, and Ollie Cooks. On the surface, the names of all of these recipes appear to be inherently Dutch or Dutch American. But if we look at these recipes a little bit more deeply, we can pinpoint moments wherein foodways constitute a negotiation of power and cultural identity. The fundamental distinction here, and I can't stress that enough, is that there's nothing about these dishes that makes them inherently Dutch or inherently Dutch American. They're the result of active appropriation by generations of multi-ethnic women in the Hudson River Valley who then in turn have generated an applied cultural identity into them. Consumption is an active practice and Grandmother Beck and Catherine were participating in the act of adapting the mass culture around them and transforming it into digestible pieces and rituals that affirmed their space within New York society. Conchies, for example, are nothing more than boiled puddings made from pumpkin and cornmeal. 
The idea of conchies, as we've discussed, is neither distinctly Dutch nor Dutch American. However, the fact that both grandmother Beck and Catherine insisted on calling them conchies instead of pumpkin pudding or even Indian pudding it is inherently cultural. This occurs both in the Beck Market book and also in the later Van Cortland Receipts book in the letter from Grandmother Beck. We can see this idea um, contextualized within the strategies, which are the performative elite culture signified by ethnic Dutchness and the tactics, tactics rather, um, where women like Catherine who are making everyday decisions about what to prepare and serve in the most central location of their homes, their kitchens. In 1796, Amelia Simmons penned and published American Cookery, or at least we assume it's Amelia Simmons, that's a whole different talk. Um, American Cookery was the first cookbook written by an American and published in the United States. American cookery includes multiple recipes for dishes that use cornmeal and invariably they refer to those recipes in one way or another as Indian. Simmons naming of these dishes connects them to the new worldness of maize and to the food customs of Native Americans. However, Beck's naming of conchies indicates a complicated process wherein this family or even a larger grouping of Hudson Valley elites absorbed this quotidian just everyday dish and use their access to systems of power and influence to define it and insist on it being Dutch American. And in doing so, they're revealing this deep attachment that new Americans and new New Yorkers had to their Dutch identity, even if that Dutch identity was in fact a new world creation brought into existence by the intermingling of cultures and consumers among the major travel routes of colonial New York. As we saw in um, T.R. Beck's eulogy, the family was not was of late Dutch descent, but they'd lived among the Dutch so long that they were considered to be Dutch. It's the same thing happening here, but instead of happening in a eulogy, we see it happening with food. Even if these recipes relied on entirely American ingredients like pumpkin and cornmeal, we have the Becks and subsequently the Van Cortlands looking at them and seeing them as old family recipes and identifying them with names that people who were perhaps living in the Netherlands may not have even recognized. What's perhaps most notable and interesting about conchies is the week and a half rabbit hole that I spent looking at recipes for them. Um, it's not really easy to find recipes for this dish. Um, if you Google conchies, you don't really get much of anything. Um, and there is something that historians, especially culinary historians, have kind of rather misunderstood over the years. Um, and this is where studying history gets kind of wild. So we have some sources citing Peter Kalm's journal as saying that a boiled pumpkin and cornmeal pudding essentially the equivalent of conchies, is an inherently Dutch dish common to the Albany region of New York. Um, interestingly though, these assertions by historians have all been based on a 1930s translation of Kalm's journal. Because knowing whether or not conchies are actually Dutch Albany foods is so important to my study, I made a really important point of going back to earlier translations of Peter Kalm's journals to see if it was referenced there as well. I looked at two 1770s English translations and I even spent, like I said, a long couple of days working with Anne um, through the original Swedish journal. I do not speak or read old Swedish, so it was definitely a challenge. I enlisted a lot of help, including um, an acquaintance who is a UN interpreter, and together we all kind of pieced together this page, page 475 um, on the left and the English equivalent on the right. It's clear that none of these earlier editions reference conchies or their unnamed equivalent as being particularly Dutch or specific to Albany. In fact, Calm seems to indicate that this process of creating pumpkin cornmeal pancakes is something that Native Americans do, that French do, and that English may in fact do. So this interlude, this anecdote about spending so many days stuck in old Swedish is a good reminder to all of us to double check our sources and to always remember to read our sources critically. 
Well, we, we may assume that a 1930s translation is faithful. It was created at a point in history when there was an intense colonial revival sentiment that may have caused the translators to embed some of their own beliefs and biases in their work. Um, and if you're interested in seeing some side-by-side -side, uh, translations of these things, let me know, drop me a line and I can pull them up. If we continue on into the Van Cortlandt family recipes, one that is included of note is familiar in one way or another um, to us and would have been familiar to the Beck's contemporaries. Ole cooks were the Dutch predecessor of our American cookies. Um, these were made by forming a sweetened yeast dough that sometimes contained nuts or fruits. In the Van Cortlandt recipe, it calls for raisins, um, stewed cranberries and currant jam, and then fried in balls. If you're going to any 18th century Hudson Valley Museum that does a cooking demonstration, there would be invariably some form of Ole Cooks present. Um, we also have recipes for pufferts, which were a sweetened yeast leaven fried pancake. And pufferts need a little bit more research, um, kind of like with conchies, no one has done a concerted um, study of them. So that's an, another intriguing opportunity. Um, Cullings, however, that last recipe, make our understanding of how identity was negotiated and understood in kitchen spaces a little bit more sticky. And it challenges our knowledge of how, or it challenges our understanding rather, of how knowledge was transmitted. I had initially assumed that Cullings was a misspelling of crullers. It would make sense. Um, crullers were essentially what we would recognize today as donuts. Crullers were a historic item. But the recipe for Cullings doesn't add up. It clearly would not produce a cruller. The recipe for Cullings calls for the baker to boil about a quart of suppin well done. Suppin was essentially cornmeal mush, a variation of a continental porridge that had been adapted to Native American foodways um, and adopted from indigenous peoples. So the base of this recipe then is almost a type of polenta that was sweetened and then thickened with wheat flour. Grandmother Beck did not specify how to bake the culling, but she did say, <coughs> excuse me, that it should be about the thickness as for pound cake. And she continues on to say, Espanim will show you whether it is too slack or too stiff. Espanim is a person, but her identity is not known yet. It does not appear that she is a member of the Van Cortland or Beck families, though she may very well have been a member of their household in a domestic capacity. The difficulty with finding Espanim is that um, census data at this point in history was not enumerated. Um, so we may have reference to um, enslaved individuals or domestics um, generally, but typically they're not named in census data. So I'm struggling to find her, but I haven't given up yet. What we do know for certain, though, is that Grandmother Beck anticipated that Espanim and Catherine would venture together to the basement kitchen at Van Cortland Manor to prepare this dish together, and that Espanim would show Catherine how to make it, the, that the labor and expertise needed to prepare this dish would be transmitted partially through her own words via the recipe, but also partially through the guidance and knowledge offered by this unknown woman. Together, they, Espanim and Catherine would pull together the sugar, flour, and cornmeal needed to mix the batter. On the open hearth, they would boil about a quart of supin well done before mixing it into the sugar and flour on the long work table until it was about the thickness of pound cake, but not too stiff. If the final product of the recipe was to be baked, which we're not sure about because the directions are missing, the deep beehive oven, <coughs> excuse me, Set back within the hearth could be fired and the batter could be poured into pans to bake. If the culling were to be fried, a large kettle of lard could be heated on the crane over the open fire. The women would have needed to take care not to trip on the slightly uneven hearth bricks as they reached above the mantle to pull down crocks of spices or as they snipped, ch snipped chunks off of a sugar cone. As I envision this experience, I pull back and I recenter this image of Van Cortlandt Manor as it exists today. The echoes of Espanim and Catherine fade and the smell of browning cornmeal vanishes. And so we're left to wonder why any of this matters. I believe that we all live in a world of food, 
a world in which the choice of what we eat at any given time has been broadly advertised, will be socially and culturally critiqued, and will have an environmental impact that has been weighed as duly as the poundage of the commodity we have chewed and swallowed. In this modern world of eating, we are constantly assaulted by new trends, by new unfamiliar dishes to tempt us and expand our understanding of what it means to be consumers in a global civilization. In recent years, we have chefs, farmers, and self-proclaimed foodies who've promoted a type of heritage cuisine that draws on what they claim to be our shared American past as a way to develop a healthier, sustainable, and sustaining diet. Major modern trends such as whole foods, slow foods, and the logovore movement all embody this backwards looking mentality and all promote a belief in this idea that our ancestors were consuming better food in a more wholesome way. Bookstores are filled with manuals explaining how to grow heirloom seeds in your garden or how to raise heritage breeds in your backyard. I do it. Um, I have a flock of heritage breed chickens. These modern food movements are all chiefly a rejection of an industrialized food system that was established during the 19th century. So this means then that these people, these authors, are contemporaries, people who are looking at gastro obscura and pinning recipes on Pinterest, are looking back to the world of Catherine Beck Van Cortland and to the world of Grandmother Beck, to this pre-industrial food system. This pre-industrial food system that's presented by modern food writers has also permeated through to public history events and institutions. Terms like old fashioned and heirloom and heritage are used in both settings, sometimes without context for what they actually mean. And instead, they're kind of insinuating any period from early contact through to the 1960s. Um, one regionally well-known heirloom cookbook defines heirloom um, uh, and heritage also, as you are, and they uses them, um, uh, sorry, uh, so they're defining heirloom as having this like intangible characteristic um, that is deeply related to a modern individual sense of a connection to the past. But this past isn't identified as any particular time period. Instead, the authors state only that heirlooms are something that is passed from generation to generation. So this interpretation relies on building a connection between modern individuals and a storied and potentially a historical past. Food writers aren't alone in this. Public history institutions are also using this terminology and approach when discussing food. And in a lot of ways, this food history, this world that they're hearkening back to may not have existed. There's a sense of nostalgia that permeates a lot of this writing that's more characteristic of a Wallace nutting painting than of an actual 18th or 19th century marketplace or kitchen. In place of spitting roasts and charred bones, we have food writers and public history sites presenting sanitized idyllic gardens and free range chickens as a historical uh, alternative. So this ignores the messy and laborious aspects of food production and consumption. It ignores Catherine and Espinim negotiating what Cullings were in this kitchen. <clears throat> so this, I believe, is one of the reasons that Catherine Beck Van Cortland and her first family recipes matter. Food is one of the universal ways in which humans understand and negotiate their lives. And as a result, understand and negotiate their understandings of the past. Without the Beck uh, market book and the Van Cortland family recipes, Catherine may have remained a footnote in the history of prominent New York families. Um, despite the fact that she was an elite woman, despite the fact that she spent many years of her life advocating for inmate rights at Sing Sing during the 19th century, she has not been cohesively studied. Her cookery books, end up being a powerful tool for examining the ways in which 18th and 19th century New Yorkers understood themselves, how they identified themselves, how they identified others, and how they wanted to be perceived by the greater world. Catherine's family cookbooks push us to expand our understanding of the Hudson River Valley into the geographical western frontier of New York, as well as north into Canada, and Southeast to the broader world of networked trade that connected all of the individuals we talked about today. <clears throat>
Historians like to say that early America was less of a melting pot and more of a stew, a rich stew in which pods of cultural groups retained their identities and customs. I would argue though, that it's a little bit more like a good old fashioned American casserole. The ingredients retain their own form, but they take on a bit of the flavor of what's around them in an effort to create a truly unique whole. And so in closing, I leave you our four Van Cortland recipes sent from grandmother Beck to Catherine. We have the conchies, the culling. See, we have here, Espanine will show you whether it is too slack or too stiff. We have pufferts and we have Oli cooks. The Oli cooks to me look particularly delicious. Um, Oli cooks, like I said, would kind of be like a, a, a fried donut um, they would be stuffed in this recipe with either raisins or cranberries or currant jam, um, maybe dusted with sugar before they were eaten, would be absolutely delicious. Um, and yeah, I will leave you with the recipes because they speak for themselves. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I have to say one of the things I find so interesting with these sorts of old recipes is how uh, colonists sort of took the new ingredients and, and I say new in inverted commas like pumpkins sweet corn things that would not have been there in England or in the Netherlands and sort of incorporated them into their family traditional things and called them you know whatever it happened to be um, you know we do that all the time that's what I, I, I find so interesting is how they did that. Absolutely. Um, I think like one of the most important things that I took away um, from my research was that we have these people intentionally identifying these things as family recipes and giving them names that maybe other people didn't use but there's nothing particular about them that makes them a family recipe. Um, as a modern example, um, my family makes what we call depression soup. Um, it's a recipe from my great grandmother who lived in rural upstate New York during the Great Depression. Um, and she was on a farm, so they had access to milk um, and bacon and produce from the garden. So it's a soup made from new potatoes, new green beans, um, bacon, and it's a brothy milk base. I just found out this past year that basically everyone has some approximation of that recipe that they have a different name for. Um, so it's just a, a modern equivalent of this historic situation that we have. I do have one question that I don't know if this is relevant or not, but um, yeah, I'm English and our recipes all tend to be given in terms of weight, whereas I see most American ones are given in terms of volume, given in terms of cups. And I saw that that Lake George fruitcake had a mixture of both types of measurement. Do you know where that, what, why, why that would be, why they, why they put the raisins in terms of pounds and the rest in terms of cups? Just so curious. So you're absolutely right. So what I found in 18th and 19th century cookery books is that it is a combination of weights um, and measures. Um, I'm assuming for the raisins, it was because it, it like, so raisins, um, depending on how they were processed, it wasn't as standardized as raisins were today. So a cup of raisins, if they were hyper dehydrated, would have been substantially smaller than a, a, a cup of raisins that had not been quite as processed or dehydrated. Um, so I'm assuming that it might perhaps be a standard way of you know, making sure that you got enough. I'm not sure why they, why they picked that one, um, but it is common to see a combination of um, both actual measurements and then like cup or spoon equivalents. Um, that would be a good, a good thing to explore. Sorry, I've given you another rabbit hole. Um, it's totally all right. My life <laughs> is, is rabbit holes. That's research. Um, does anybody have any more questions or comments or anything? <laughs> 
we go. Well, Sarah, thank you so much indeed. That was lovely. And it, um, if no, if people haven't had a chance to get a copy of the recipes that Sarah posted up at the end, if you haven't done a, a, a screenshot or anything, we're going to put this out on our YouTube channel probably in, uh, in a week or so, assuming I've recorded it correctly. Um, and uh, I think all, I, all that's left is to thank you very much indeed and to remind people to uh, check on our website, see what exciting things we've got coming up. We've got, a, uh, I know we've got a Toys and Games on uh, Friday and I know we've other things, but I can't remember off the top of my head. Please check the website, please check social media. And we look forward to seeing everybody sometime again at one, uh, another one of our events. Thank you so much for being here.